In this session, you are going to learn how to design offers that connect and resonate with your audience, how to simplify multiple offers into one scalable, simple, repeatable offer, and how to price your offer so it sells. This was a pre-recorded coaching session that we did for our WAIM Unlimited members. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to wanderingamefully.com slash join. But now, jump into the session. Hello and welcome to our spotlight session, Offers That Sell. Yes, that's what we all want. Yeah. We want to create an offer and Particularly, we wanted to sell. I think so we're going to talk about positioning. We're going to talk about a, lot, a bunch more stuff. Oh, by the way, this is one of our spotlight sessions. If you didn't know that yet, maybe this is your very first coaching session. Maybe. Just a reminder Welcome. that this format is designed to help you get the best, most actionable info out of Wayne. So these sessions are designed to bring the most potent, actionable advice to the surface. Our previous sessions, we're now in our 42nd coaching session, which is amazing. Those will remain a rich library of skills you can dig into to support these fundamental topics. Think of these like a snorkel and think of our previous sessions like a deep dive. That's right. So we're just kind of skimming the surface. You can see maybe a manta ray. I don't know where you're snorkeling. Oh. Probably somewhere magical. And if you're near, seeing a manta ray, manta rays are near the congratulations. surface. Congratulations. Have you yeah. ever seen a manta ray? Sometimes they breach. They're like the magical mystical creatures that fly through the ocean. It's unbelievable. Also, I think they have like three brains or something. Okay. Let's get into part one. We have the explainer, as we mentioned here. So let's dig into the crucial frameworks you need to understand to come up with a killer offer that sells. I'm going to be reading two slides and then you're I'm going to turn it over to Caroline you're here. You're so good at reading. In them. the massive puzzle which we all love puzzles. All the way, shout out to uh, all the Waymers who love puzzles. Who are the puzzle lovers Puzzlers. who are here live, by the way? Who are the puzzle lovers? Puzzle crew. Because some of you, I know like a Cheryl Chan yes. loves a good puzzle. Uh, I know love Catherine puzzles. loves a good puzzle. We may have a lot of puzzlers. Uh, massive puzzle that is creating a profitable business. Few pieces so are puzzlers. more important than building an offer that's designed to sell. So let's break down an offer into its individual parts so we can tackle each one. All okay. right, here's where it starts, Carol. You know I love to break concepts down. So yeah. an offer is simply an exchange of value for money in its most simple parts, right? So you have somebody with something, you have another somebody with money, and someone gives you that money, and then you give them the value, and ta-da, we have an offer. We have okay? a business. <laughs> and so the parts here are, the real question is, what is the value? We're going to call that the solution. Who's paying for the value? We're gonna call that your audience. And then how much are they paying? We're gonna call that the price, okay? And so when you really think about offers, these are the key players. And the key here is, in order to have an offer that sells, you need these things in alignment. The solution, the price, and the audience. So each of these individual things has many variables and many considerations, but if you just distill down the goal into its very simplest form, it, the question really becomes, do these things match? And we're gonna go into what does that really mean? How do I find out if those three things match? Because when they match, you have an offer that sells. Solution, price, audience, cool? So let's dig in here. So what, is, what do we mean when we say they match? Well, in order for those three things to be in alignment, your solution needs to match your price. And what that means is the ROI and the perceived value of your solution needs to match your price in the mind of your audience. Similarly, your price needs to match your audience, meaning your price needs to match what your audience can and will pay for your solution. And then finally, your audience needs to match your solution, meaning your audience needs to be aware that they need your solution. So it's like, these are kind of the individual pieces of making sure those things align to get all three of those into a place where they align. Now, what does it look like when these things don't align? Because I think examples are more helpful. So what would be an example of the solution not matching the price? Just as an example, if I was selling a hobby course on how to make clay earrings for $2,000, right? I'm not selling a course on how to like become a jewelry designer business and then you can make that 2,000 on the back end. It's like, well, if this person is really, the solution is really just, oh, I wanna make a couple of pretty earrings for myself to wear, the price probably doesn't match the ROI. Boy, you'd have to have some real killer bonuses in there. <laughs> Now let's give an example of when the price wouldn't match the audience, okay? So if I was selling a $20,000 website package, maybe for early stage nonprofits, like probably my audience is just not gonna be in a place where they can afford to pay for that. Of course you can make arguments about like, well, if I sold it this way, they yeah, would understand there are the value. Exceptions, of course there are exceptions. Sure. But this really illustrates like, that's gonna be an offer that you have to work 10 times harder to sell, right? We want offers that sell basically themselves because they have those three things in alignment. And then your final example, when the audience doesn't match the solution would be maybe like selling an advanced site speed audit for brick and mortar hardware stores. I like you could, you could argue that that would be helpful for them, but does the audience really match the solution that you're trying to provide? Probably not. So those are just examples 
I think it's helpful to see when they're not in alignment and we can dig into each one further. So the question becomes, how do you go about designing an offer that has these three things in alignment? I think you start with your audience. I think this is kind of the way that we at least have gone about it in the past. Start with your audience. That can inform your solution. Your solution can then inform your price. And then here's the little sneaky fourth piece here. Your price can then inform your message, which connects all uh, every piece back to your audience, right? Because it's one thing to have the three audience solution and price in alignment. It's another thing to be able to communicate that to your audience so that they get it and that your offer does in fact sell. So that message piece, that fourth piece is really important. Now, if we design these things right, you get what we call a chef's kiss offer. A chef's kiss offer equals more cash and more calm. So it just works. Like this is what we mean by chef's kiss offer. It's something that's repeatable. It's something that's scalable and it's simple. And it's something that you can do for a long period of time. And you can really see that revenue in your business to then have more free time to then have more fun, which is what we're all trying to do here. So when creating a chef's kiss offer, we want you to think- Get ready for it. Of course we have an acronym. The Get acronym ready for it. is kisses. <laughs> this is so exciting. We had to go on a walk for Caroline to explain this to me when she came up with it, just for you all to know okay. how excited you she know, got about this. You know we love acronyms. Yeah. Um, I wanna be clear, these are consensual chef's kisses, okay? Yes, of course. And so these are the six things that we want you to think about when you think about what is involved. The components of a chef's kiss offer creates more calm and more profit in your business. We want you to think of K as known problem meaning a known problem for your target audience. And we'll dig into each one of these. The I we want you to think about is, is it interesting to you? Meaning enjoyment matters. And again, we'll dig into each one. The S stands for, is it scalable for your energy input and your profit output? The second S is social proof that your solution actually works for other people, for your customers. E is for economical to your customer for the ROI. That's where we'll really talk about price. And then S is singular, set apart from what else is out there. So these are kind of the six components. Known problem, interesting, scalable, social proof, economical, singular, okay? And again, we'll dig into each one. We're gonna dig into the kisses. <laughs> dig into the kisses. <laughs> so the all six of these things actually kind of align to those four key pieces that we talked about. So for the known problem, this is really gonna be the stage where you're brainstorming offers for your audience. This is where you're gonna find that known problem. And by known, it means they actually know that this is a problem. So it doesn't matter if, like I, I remember. Yeah, I mean, I just, I was just gonna say like, we have all I think been guilty of coming up with an idea for a course or PDF or anything, but it's actually not a problem that people might have. It's just like a curiosity maybe we had or that yep. we thought. And, and then you're when, trying to kind of retrofit the problem, yeah. right? You're like, well, maybe they're bored with blah, blah. It's like, do, do, they, do they think that they're bored though? And a lot of times that really matters. what happens when people aren't buying something from you, it's that you've identified a product idea that's actually not a problem that they have, yes. which, which we've run into multiple times. Yes, and so, and this is why I think it's important to start with audience because if you start with the solution and then retrofit it to your audience, a lot of times you end up creating a solution that you don't, like you have to go searching for an audience and that's much harder, right? So start with that audience and ask yourself what those problems are, which we'll, we'll do in a second. So the interesting and scalable piece of the Chef's Kiss offer really have to do with your solution and evaluating different solutions as offer packages, which we'll do in this presentation as well. And then finally, the social proof, the economical and the singular pieces, that, that really has to do with selling your offer, coming up with your price, and then put, packaging that into a message that your audience understands. So. We'll, we'll go through each piece of this of these stages, um, but I just wanted to show you how those six kind of components will pop up in the presentation. So an important thing to remember is that you're probably not gonna hit this chef's kiss target right out of the gate, okay? So it will take experimentation, but we hope that by knowing what to look for, you'll get much more discerning in which offer ideas you want to experiment with because you know that they at least are kind of fit that criteria of what you're aiming for in a chef's kiss offer. Um, and just to really hit this point home, I wanted to bring up our WAME revenue growth over the past, what is it now, five, five years, years since yep. starting Wandering Aimfully in 2018. And the things that I want to point out to you here are you kind of see like right when we launched in 2018, like we, we kind of have this initial bump just from I think the excitement and- From Nikki, from Rachel, <laughs> yeah, from, all from like all of you who were here at the very beginning, that you're our yellow line of growth. Thank you so much. Yep. 
And then you can kind of see where in the 2018 to 2019, it sort of levels out, right? We hit this like plateau. And then from that point forward, you can kind of see, yes, you see our ups and downs from our launches, but the overall trend line is increasing. And the big thing that we want you to note here is that this point right here is when we found our chef's kiss offer of unboring coaching. And this is the impact that coming up with an offer that actually sells can have on your business and your revenue. I did wanna let all of you know, especially for those of you who are like freelancers or client business owners, you may very well be in the, the uh, yellow or the pink and you're trying to get to the green, but that's also like a great place to be because you already have some leverage in your business. So don't feel like, oh, I'm making a digital product business and I'm, or I'm at zero, like I'm before the line. You're not, you're actually in the yellow and pink. It's just, you're trying to get into the green in a different scale of a way because your client business is still your business. So just as a little reminder there. Let's do this. Let's begin with your audience. So who does your business help? And shout out to our business foundation spotlight session, which was from January. Um, those of you who are new may not have seen it yet. What makes a chef's kiss audience though, right? And this is slightly different, but here's kind of a checklist of things that I now want you to take that broad category and I want you to kind of cross-reference it with these things. So is your audience niche enough that you can speak to their pain points and hurdles very specifically? And then on the flip side of that, do you have skills that can actually alleviate those pain points? So that's really important in the process of coming up with the solution, which we'll do in a second. Is this audience of people growing or shrinking in the macro sense? Again, this isn't like necessarily a deal breaker, but I think it is important to know, are you going after a group of people that's going to get bigger or get smaller? Yeah, and I, I think a really good example of this is like, if you're someone who's currently like building resources around Canva, Canva to me is a market that's growing. Like right. that is a that is a platform that is getting a lot more attention. They're building a lot more features. Like that's a good place to be. But let's say you were somebody who was using what's like an older outdated. Flicker. Yeah. Well, no, like an older outdated app, like Adobe Illustrator, I would say. It's still a good app and There's people still use it, but I would say on a macro growing I don't think Illustrator is a good one because I still think they're innovating, but let's Think about like software that like, yeah, people don't use anymore. Yeah, anyway, just like, just to give you the example, Canva would be the market that I would say is the growing. Yep. And then something you would be like, oh, I think that's kind of like old and outdated. That would be an example yep. there. Corel Draw, thank you, Isa. Thank yes. you, <laughs> thank you. Corel Draw has to be on the downturn. If it's on the upturn and, and I don't know, don't tell paint. me. Yeah. Uh, okay, so next question. What level of purchasing power does your audience have? Again, this is not a deal breaker, but I do think you really wanna think about for the future of your business, you know, are you trying to target a group of people that's going to have a hard time paying for services or have a, have a hard time at wherever they are in their journey? It's important to note that so that you can try to target, okay, maybe I need to go upstream. Like maybe I need to go target not the person at the beginning where really they don't have a ton of that discretionary income, maybe down the line a little bit when they're further in their business. That's just an example. Again, not a deal breaker, but I think it's worth asking the question. Can you list at least three ways you could find target find slash target people in this audience. Again, it's gonna make your life easier if you know that there's a specific place online that these people hang out. Um, that could make your life kind of easier or harder depending on who you're targeting. So these are all just good questions to ask yourself and it's not like if the answer is no to some of these or um, that it means don't try to target that audience. It just is food for thought for you to go, is there a way for me to shift it just slightly um, to you know, make the, make the audience easier to target or to go upstream like I was discussing. And then finally, this is a very important one. Is this a group of people you actually want to be helping? Yep. Um, you know, is it gonna make your life harder because you don't enjoy interacting with this group of people? And that's just the truth. Like sometimes if you target an audience that you know is going to be full of complaining or you know expecting so much from you or whatever like that matters too because it matters what you're going to be go doing day in and day out and who you're going to be interacting with and this is why we always talk about identifying your ideal audience like what are those factors that make that person ideal what are the clients you've had in the past that have been ideal and what makes them unique and kind of the pattern that you can find there so let's dig into these top two here like is your audience niche enough that you can speak to their pain points and hurdles and do you have skills that can alleviate those pain points and the thing here is every offer should start with a problem you're trying to solve for your audience. We've talked about this so many times, but it's just the truth. If you can't clearly articulate the problem your offer solves, you will find it very difficult to market it. And I think this is like harder than we think, especially because we're a lot of us are creatives and a lot of us come up with ideas. And then like we said, we try to retrofit the problem after. 
But if you don't have that known problem piece, like everything you do to try to market your, your offer is going to be harder. And I have very real experience with this because for those of you who have not been around since the Made Vibrant days, this was one of my favorite things that I ever made and it was also the hardest thing to market. The absolute hardest thing to market. I created this thing called Color Your Soul. It was a monthly subscription. You know, when I look back on it, I'm like, I think it could have worked in like a Patreon format type mm -hmm. of thing because I do think Patreon is a little different than say trying to solve a problem for someone. It's more of a patronage. It's more of, I want to support your art, your creative. I think it is a little bit of a different model, but I was trying to market it as solving a problem that people did not have. Yeah. And I found it extremely difficult and I had to basically close it down after like four or five months. I don't regret it at all. It taught me a lot, but you know, oops, I led with what I wanted to create and not necessarily what my audience needed. That's okay. I just should have not expected the economics to work out in my favor. So when you think about your audience, you want to think about the transformation and their pain points, right? We've done this exercise in different ways in different coaching sessions, but it's always a good one to come back to. So what is the ultimate outcome they're looking for? And you want to paint a picture of how things would be different for them if they achieved this transformation. And then you want to list out what are their pain points? What is, what is painful in their day-to-day -day right now? What problems do they encounter over and over again? What is standing in their way from achieving the transformation? And that's going to give you a whole bunch of ideas in order to match that with a solution. So let's just use an example here. Um, this was just an example because it's been top of mind for me because we've been thinking a lot about YouTube lately, but whatever, it's an example. Yeah. Imagine our audience was just YouTube creators. To be more specific, because YouTube creators kind of is, is very broad, um, let's say our audience is YouTube creators with channels of 50,000 subscribers who are looking to grow past 100,000 subscribers. Okay, so that makes it very obvious what the transformation is. They wanna grow to over 100,000 subscribers. Why do they want to do that? It's because let's say they wanna be able to charge for sponsorship deals, which means that they'll be able to become full-time content creators, right? So I'm kind of like, you're putting yourself in the shoes of your audience and going like, what do they really want? Like what, it's not just that they, maybe some of them just want the vanity metric, but really it's because that means that if they have a big enough channel, they can do a sponsor deal. And that means that they can create content full-time and leave their, their, their job that they also have, right? So if I was trying to target this audience, I would write down some of their pain points. I would say, okay, they spend a lot of time editing. Maybe at this point, they're actually still editing their own videos. So they're just busy doing that all the time. They're so busy that they don't have brain power to think about the strategy of growing their channel. They're just on the content hamster wheel and they're trying to get their next video out. And so now you wanna go, okay, what is my solution for them to achieve their transformation? I'm gonna think about their pain points. And I'm gonna say like, what skills do I have in order to you know, be able to get them this transformation? And let's say I'm a video editor. And so my solution is to create short form video content and strategy so that they can grow their channel because we know that YouTube shorts and short term video is like where things are growing right now. Um, and so that, again, I'm not this person, but if I was, this is how I would go about coming up with that solution for my audience. And we're gonna use shorts to gain subscribers and grow their channel. Cool, but now that's just the solution, but there are a million different ways to deliver this solution, right? That's not really an offer. That's a solution, but it's not an offer. So. You could serve this up in all kinds of different offer shapes and sizes. You could create a guide that would help them to create shorts. You could create a coaching program. You could create templates. You could create a client service where you do it all for them. You could create an online course, right? There's a million different ways that you could package this. And each of these offers is going to have a different time and energy commitment. It's gonna have a different level of scalability and it'll probably have a different price, which is a good thing because it gives you as the creator options. Um, you can you know, come up with ideas and you can think which of these offers not only works for my audience, but works for me too as the business owner. So we wanna teach you how to come up with endless offer ideas. But first, why? Why is it important to be able to come up with ideas? And it's because endless offer ideas means a higher chance of you finding an offer that gets you more cash and more calm, that chef's kiss offer. It also means less money, fear, and scarcity. And this is a really important one that I just wanna pause on for a second. Because we are idea people, I sometimes I, I realize that that has such an impact on the, mo the money mindset that we are able to have because I think to myself, I, we will never run out of ideas. Yeah. I can say that so confidently. We will never run out of ideas of how to turn our skills into something that someone is willing to pay for. And if you can get to that place where you go, I have skills, 
I have things of value. I just need to figure out how to package them into a way that someone can pay me for. You will have so much less fear around like that scarcity mindset of like, where's the money going to come from? Because you will always be able to come up with more ideas. And that's what I want for you. I don't want you to have that fear of what if it all falls apart tomorrow? I want you to be like, and we all, all, we all think that about our businesses. Of course. So it's, it's just good to know that you're in a place where you're like, okay, I have other skills. I have other ideas. And if you're in a place right now where you're like, I don't have those things. Well, hopefully the rest of the session will help. Totally. And then finally, because more creativity, more fun and more innovation, because coming up with offers is fun and ideas are fun. So this is our solution for having you never run out of offer ideas again. It's the solution slot machine. Yeah. Okay? And it's a fun little experiment. So the idea here is that we have three little variables. We have the skill, we have the depth and delivery, and then we have the time to value. And let's break down each one of these further. So again, using our example of helping YouTube creators who don't have time to edit short form, short form video, turn their content into short form for shorts, reels, and TikTok. Again, that's our like big overarching solution, right? We know yep. their pain points. We know what their transformation is that they're trying to get to. And this is their our general solution. But how do we package that? We break it down into the skill, the depth and delivery, and the time to value. So your skill means what skills are involved in achieving this solution that you have. It could be skills, it could be expertise, it could be you know a, a certain level of taste. Um, we go into a lot of these different aspects in the identifying your offer session, which a little dive deeper to in a second. But what is the skill that's involved in achieving the solution? Depth and delivery is what are the ways that you could deliver an online solution and how deep is your involvement going to be in that delivery method? Okay. So is it, a lot of you may have heard of these acronyms done for you, right? Like that's a client service is it's done for you. Like I pop in there, you don't have to do the work. Like I do your website, right? Or is it done with you? So like we're, there's some level of involvement where there's effort on their part, your client's part, but also there's effort on your part. You're doing it together, a strategy, you're you know doing it with them, you're brainstorming, whatever, or do it yourself solution, meaning you download the guide, you do it all by yourself, right? So what level of involvement? And you can kind of break it down into those three ways. And then finally, time to value. So how long until the, from the purchase until when your customer experiences the value of that offer? And so these are kind of the variables that you can kind of change up in order to come up with like endless offer ideas, right? So your first thing you're gonna do is write a list for each of these. So if, again, for our YouTube shorts solution idea, the skills, let's say that I have that could somehow relate to getting this solution for someone would be video editing. Let's say like I also know how to do motion graphics. Let's say I also am really good at storytelling so I know how to capture someone's attention. Maybe I have a skill of what I'm gonna call gold nugget mining. So like I'm really good at picking out like from long form content, like what's interesting. Animation, I, I have some animation skills so I know how to like create an entire animated video that explains a concept. And maybe like I have social, like again, I don't know if someone would have all these skills, but whatever yeah. those are, a lot of you are very, uh, lots of skills. So you're gonna write down all of those skills, right? For depth and delivery, there's pretty much gonna be a list that you can pick from that we have in the workbook but you can always add to it because there's like infinite amount of, of packaging things, whether it's like an audio course or it's a written course. I mean, people are always coming up with different ideas for packages, but here's just a list of some. So a service package, a strategy guide, which would be done with you, a coaching program done with you, templates could be DIY or um, done with you, video course DIY, guide DIY, right? So you're gonna list all of the different ways that you could deliver the solution. And then we kind of have these like different categories of time. So self-paced is really, it, it's up to them how long they, till they get the value, but you could do an extra short. So this is really where I saw a lot of innovation around the like design day that happened like five or six years ago where people were like, oh, you could design a website in a day. <laughs> this is somebody tweaking that and saying, what if the time to value was extra short? What if it was just a day and at the end of it, you could get an entire website? That's somebody tweaking that and going, huh, that's a unique offer idea. More people are doing it now, of course, but again, it just shows you how that tweaking that variable really gets you a unique offer. Short is what I would call like a week. Medium would be like weeks to one month. Long would be months long and then extra long might be six plus months. Before we get into the slot machine, yes. just a real quick question for those of you who are here live and also to give Caroline a break from talking. Um, what do you think, or better question, what was your time to value with Wayne from these categories? 
was it self-paced? Was it extra short? Was it short, medium, long? Like, when did you feel the value of Wayne like mm -hmm. came to you in your experience? Because there's no I, wrong answer, by the way. Yeah, because I think that is actually the difference between something like Wayne that's like this huge comprehensive thing with so many different resources. Is for some people, it might be in the first day they find the coaching session they need, they find the practical tips. But for others of you, you you may have been here for a year and you're still waiting to find the full value. But that's also because you might be at a different part in your journey, so you need to learn all the different things. And what we'll share with you. By the way, it's super cool to see our yeah. answers. Thank you. In a little bit, we'll show you different ways that you can actually increase the value of your offer, which means you'll be able to increase the price of your offer. And one of those ways is to shorten the time to value. And so even though something like Wayne that has you know a variable time to value with things like a welcome sequence that's that's why we do that have we have an onboarding sequence about hey jump into this resource or hey jump into slack and it's because we know that the more someone in involves themselves in wame the shorter their time to value and overall the more value of the offer itself right yeah so now comes the fun part. So we have all three of our lists, right? You're gonna make a list of each one of those three things, your skill, your depth and delivery, and your time to value, and now you just... Pull that lever. You pull that lever, you run... Look at you building a slot machine I know, machine I built Keynote. a slot machine in Keynote. You pull the slot machine, and so for our example, short form content for YouTube, YouTubers who want to grow, our slot machine told us, okay, I'm gonna combine storytelling, templates, and it's gonna be self-paced. So my offer package idea, my solution package could be some type of storytelling Mad Lib scripts for shorts that are gonna keep your uh, audience's attention and self-paced. So a YouTube creator could basically download these templates. It's all about storytelling. They would use it themselves, right? That's just an idea using those three things. But like- Do we get to pull it again? Let's change the middle Ooh, one there. exciting. So instead of templates, now it's gonna be a done for you package. And instead of self-paced, let's do extra short. So maybe now my solution package idea is 50 shorts in a day. It's a storytelling client package where you we get on Zoom for an entire day, you get me for an entire day, and together we write 40 short scripts. So it's only one day of your time, but you get an entire like 50 scripts right at your, right? So it's just, it's coming up like this lever system where you're just combining different things is going to hopefully stoke the ideas of just endlessly coming up with ideas. And then, go ahead, I was gonna. Well, we have one more. So yeah. again, let's just pull it again. Because for fun, so fun, you know? So now instead of storytelling, one of my other skills is animation. And the depth and delivery is gonna be a coaching session or a coaching program. And then the time to value is gonna be medium paced, okay? So now maybe my solution package is an animation style boot camp, which would be like, let's say six weeks long. And I'm gonna show you the fastest process to make animated shorts. That's gonna really grow your channel to 100,000 subscribers. And you get the you get that value at the end of the six weeks. So this is what it looks like in your workbook. Yeah. You're basically gonna write your three lists. You're gonna use the random number generator that's embedded and just do like whatever the minimum and then the maximum. And so it'll give you a random number in there. And then you can just put, put all the ideas together in a little table, okay? Yeah. All right, we got to dive deeper resources this if you need them. You, We've been talking about this a couple different times, but we go over a, a similar process in depth in the identifying your offer session. So if you're someone who might be watching this session and you're going, I just really don't know what my offer is. I'm really having a hard time identifying it. This session, our offer session, will go so much deeper on this, and we would definitely recommend it to watch after this to learn even more stuff. Definitely, like this is, if there's one that I could recommend to dive deeper, it's identifying your offer. And Lisa, yes, in the Google version, there is a section as well where you can type your ideas and it links to the random generator I can't embed in a Google Doc, but it's right there in the Google Doc as well. Yeah. So brainstorming offers is a valuable skill, and we want that for you. But the skill that will level up your business is deciding which offer to actually pursue, right? So evaluating your offer ideas is really important. And so these, this is where these three components of the kisses come into play. So Consensual. Consensual kisses. Yeah. Known problem, how much does your audience need it? You're interesting, remember, it's something, how much would you enjoy making and delivering it? This is something we need need to evaluate with your ideas and then is it scalable as the units increase meaning like your sales do your profits outgrow your effort that's the question you really want to ask yourself um and you know in the beginning it's not always the most important that you have a scalable offer but i really think for having a chef's kiss offer that can really like sustain you that's ultimately what you're looking for and so how do we do this how do we evaluate on the basis of these three things we create an offer scorecard and again this is actually in the identifying your offer session as well in a, in a more in-depth way. But here's the general idea is it's just a matrix. It's just a little table. So you're gonna give all of your offer ideas, you're gonna write them down from your slot machine. 
and you're gonna say, okay, what's the scalable score? From one to 10, as your units increase, does your profit outweigh your effort? That's what you're gonna ask yourself and you're kinda just gonna assign like a, just a gut score in relation to what your level of involvement is gonna be and if kind of the profits can outscale your effort. For your interesting score, how much do, would you enjoy working on it? Like how excited are you about it? And then finally, that known problem is something that we call the validation score. So how much does your audience need it? And, and even better, do you actually have evidence that your audience needs it because you have validated the product idea? So it's like, you know, people have DM'd you and said, hey, would you ever consider charging for this? Is this something that you could help me with? Or you did a pre-launch list to get, gain interest and you got, you know, quite a few people who signed up for it and said, I would definitely pay for this. There are different ways to validate your, your offer idea. Um, and so that's like the, the 10 would be like, okay, people said that they would definitely pay me for this. But you're gonna assign a score for each one of your ideas, right? So let's just do an example here with our, let's say our three ideas, the, the storytelling scripts, the 50 shorts in a day, and the animation boot camp. So for scalable, let's say the scripts are a 10 because you create them one time, it's like a PDF download. Super scalable. Or a Google Doc and it's like super scalable. Um, maybe though I'm not that interested in it, like I don't really love a Google Doc, I'm not that excited about it. And then let's just call the validation score like a five because some people have said, oh man, I would really love a, you know, people on your email list have said, I would really love these formulas written out for me, but they haven't paid you any money yet for it. So you add that all up and you get 20. Now for the 50 shorts in a day package, the scalable score, let's say, let's bring that down to a five because it is taking your time and it's gonna be a long day. It's gonna be a full day of client work, but because it is one day, you know, you really can like, you can pack them into a week if you want and then like you're free the rest of the month or whatever. So I, I think that day time period actually does make it scalable in some regard because you're not having like a weeks long client project. Maybe it's really interesting to you because you love the collaboration and like the one-on-one -on -one nature of trying to, you know, get into somebody else's content and figure out these things on the fly and someone has actually already asked you if you can please do this for them. And so let's call it, and maybe you've even done one already, like not even charging for someone, but you've actually like tried out your process, right? So let's say that's a 21. And then your animation bootcamp, let's call it a scalable score of three because it's gonna be a lot of answering people's questions and you're gonna have, you know, it's a six week program and there's gonna be a time schedule and you just feel like it's gonna take a lot of a time investment on your part. And maybe that's, it's not very interesting to you because animation actually isn't that interesting to you. And maybe like nobody's asking for it. <laughs> that's a seven, get out so of here. So it's a seven, right? So you're gonna do this and it kind of what it does is it gives you this like quantifiable way. This doesn't mean that you just go, oh, that one's the most and so I'm gonna do that offer. It just gives you a way to kind of measure things against each other and it really allows you to ask these important questions. And so if you have two that are very close in score, something that you wanna ask yourself is, do you want something that is harder to fulfill but easier to sell? Or do you want something that is easier to fulfill but harder to sell? And this is gonna be different for each person. Like sometimes it's, you might be at that place in your business where you're just getting started and it's okay if it's harder to fulfill, meaning it's gonna take like, the 50 shorts in a day package is harder to fulfill than making a prompt you know, doc one time. It just is. It's gonna take effort on your part, it's gonna take scheduling, it's gonna take like dealing with people's personalities, but Ultimately, it's probably gonna be easier to sell because of the, um, the amazing value, the shortened time to value. Someone's gonna walk away with the result they're looking for like right away, and it's probably gonna be easier to sell. And you could probably charge more for it because it's, it's gonna be higher in value. Um, whereas the shorts scripts is probably going to be easier to fulfill, meaning you just create it once, but it's gonna be a little harder to sell because you really have to play up that problem, right? So that's just a question to ask yourself. It's not a hard and fast, like whichever score comes out as the most, you do that offer. It's just an important thing to go, what do I need in my business right now? So let's say this was the one that won. We're gonna do 50 shorts in a day package. Congratulations to us, it's gonna be a great offer. <laughs> and again, if you want to find this offer scorecard, definitely recommend doing the identifying your offer session. So we did the audience. We figured out how to come up with known problems to then package that into solutions that are interesting and scalable. We're gonna pick an offer. But then this last part is really important um, about price and your message. And that's when it comes to selling your offer. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about that social proof, meaning does your audience trust and believe that you can solve their problem? That you're actually, cause that's, it's two pieces, right? It's not just enough to say, my thing is a solution to your problem it's more important that your audience believes you when you say that you can solve their problem. 
And that's what social proof is really good for. And then is it economical? And this is just the word that I came up with, that's what the acronym, um, to really communicate, do they trust and believe that the value is actually more than the price that they're gonna pay for it? And is it singular? Meaning, is your offer different from everything else that they've tried or considered before? And these are three critical pieces to selling your offer. And again, they match up to that price, which is the economical one, and then the message is really for the social proof and the singular. So let's start with price here. So does your customer believe that the value of your solution is worth more than the price they're paying for it? That's really what pricing is about. I know we say that we want them to match, but when we say we want them to match, what we really mean is we want them to actually believe that the solution, the value is more than the price. Because if I believe that what I'm getting is more than what I'm giving, like that makes me feel good, right? Like we all are like this. When we buy things, we're like, oh, what a deal. Like what a, what value? I paid this amount of money, but I got so much more back. And that's what is an offer that really is going to sell. But that doesn't always mean you have to drop your price in order to out, you know, to uh, price below your the value of your offer. That could also mean raising your price and raising the value of your solution as well. And so how do we do that? So when it comes to price, no one can tell you the right price for your offer, unfortunately. <clears throat> it takes strategic thinking and experimentation to find the right fit. But here are four ways to think about pricing. And you can play around with each one until you find a price that matches the perceived value of your offer in your audience's mind. Um, you know, Jason and I have said this in the past, like pricing to some degree really can be very arbitrary. Oh yeah. Um, it, it's about setting it and then going, okay, what, how did the market respond to that? Like you don't know how much someone's going to pay for something until you try it. But if you're someone who really likes a more formulaic approach, like I did some research on pricing and because we've always just priced things and I'm like, I've just been really fascinated by pricing lately. And so I, there's a lot of different advice out there about how to price things. And so I thought, let me just give people four different ways to think about it. And, and then let's try to like kind of come up with um, everything on the spectrum and then decide where do you want to sit on that spectrum, right? So here's how you can think about it in four different ways. And they all start with P, which is very satisfying. The four P's of the pricing. The four P's of pricing. Okay, production cost, positioning, peer, or payoff, mm. okay? Four different approaches to pricing. So let's dig into each one. So if you wanna price your um, offer based on production costs, you're gonna take what it costs to produce the offer and then just apply some sort of markup to create a profit margin for yourself. For positioning, you're gonna, if you wanna price your offer based on positioning, you want to think about how you want your audience to perceive you in the market landscape. And I'll dig and I'll kind of tell you the three main categories that that kind of breaks down into. If you want to price based on your peers, it's going to be about looking at the peers in your interest industry or similar offers and going, okay, where do I want to price myself relative to the competition? Like, do I want to be on the lower end to try to really compete on price? Or do I want to just pack it with value to try to kind of be on the higher end of where my peers are? And then finally, um, payoff. So do you want to think about the ROI of the ultimate outcome of your solution and price based on that? And so we are gonna show you this with examples. So let's take the um, 50 shorts in a day, just as an example, and I'm using like really round numbers here. You're gonna just do this exercise, but it's just to kind of illustrate, right? So for production costs, let's just say like for my time that I'm gonna spend on that for the one day, I'm gonna say that in order to produce this offer, it's really just the time. So let's say that that costs $1,000 of my time, and then I want like a 50% markup, so I'm just gonna say, okay, I'm gonna price it at $1,500. That would be production costs, right? Like, what does it cost me in, ter in terms of input? And then let me build in my profit margin. For positioning, you kind of have three different ways. So three different positions in the marketplace that you can be. So you can be the luxury position, meaning high price, high value. So let's just say that price would be like $10,000. Like I am a really good storyteller and I'm a luxury storyteller uh, um, and that gets easier when you have clients that are really big and really like, exactly. someone's like, oh, you did this for Nike. It's like, okay, great. Like I'm gonna trust exactly. this person is like, they do luxury work and you can't really charge luxury out of the gate. So that's just like something everyone should know when you get started. Like just no one can do that. You could, but you just really gotta be able to deliver. <laughs> yeah. um, so then the second one would be like the value position. So high value, low price. Um, somebody gave me the example of like 
Target would be the value position. Right. It's like for those of us in the US that have Target, because you go to Target and like for the value, for the price, like that's the value position versus the economy position being low value, low price. So maybe the quality is a little bit lower, but the price is also lower. And so you're you're playing in that landscape, right? So th- you want to you want to establish, okay, what are those three position prices? And then you want to go and look at what are three peers and what are they pricing themselves at? Maybe I go and someone who's doing similar things of like video editing or storytelling for YouTubers, 3,000. I see one who does $5,000 like monthly client retainer, $1,000, right? So you're just going to kind of see what the landscape is. And then finally, your payoff. So price based on what the ultimate outcome is. So if I believe that my 50 shorts in a day storytelling is going to help you create those 50 shorts, that's going to get you to 100,000 subscribers and you get your first sponsor deal. That first sponsor deal, maybe you can charge $15,000. So doesn't it stand to reason that my value of my offer can can be charged for $15,000? I don't know. But it's really good for you to do this exercise so you can see the landscape. So I think when you fill out this little pricing play table, you're going to end up with this spectrum, right? So you're going to kind of plot along the spectrum and say the lowest, you know, uh, economy position would be $250 all the way up to $15,000. And it helps you see that spectrum. And so you're going to go, where does your gut tell you that your offer, your offer sits on this spectrum? And maybe I would just like put it, I would be like, okay, I want to kind of be at the higher end of my peers. So I'm going to say $6,000. And then it's just a matter of going, okay, does that match my audience? And does that match the value of my solution? Because remember the value of my solution needs to be more than the price so that my audience goes, this is hands down worth it. I will pay this all day long. And so what are the ways to increase the perceived value of your offer? Here are, I think six or seven ways. Shorten the time to value. Like if you tell me that I am gonna be able to have 50 shorts, at the end of a day or at the end of a year, like I'll pay more for having it done at the end of a day, right? Make the transformation more compelling. So maybe the transformation that you're trying to get for your audience like isn't actually that exciting. It's like, oh, get like a little bit better at, you know, walking. You're like, okay, not that compelling. Yeah. So what is that really, that transformation that they're really looking for? Um, You can increase the value by making the outcome more probable. So the more that you actually, like what can you do to your offer to make it more probable that someone gets the outcome? This is why we have thought about like reconfiguring things around accountability or writing that welcome sequence. Like what are the things that are gonna make way more probable that you get the outcome that you're looking for? Make it more fun. We love this one. Because we try people, real hard on the fun. People scale. don't want to do things that, they, that are like painful. So how can you make it more fun? That's going to increase the value as well. How can you reduce the effort that someone needs to put in? This is where some of that, like a lot of times that done for you service is going to be able to be a higher price than the DIY price, right? Why is that? It's because the amount of effort that someone needs to put in at a DIY offer is so much more and therefore the value is like lower because they're like, well, I have to do a lot of this work versus if you swoop in and say like, hey, I'll do it all for you, you can charge a little bit higher because the value in their minds is more. You can up the quality of the experience, like, you know, interpret quality as you will, but like you can make it feel like a higher quality experience and therefore the value feels higher. And here's one that's kind of like an X factor is you can build an emotional connection to your brand. And this is where a lot of the branding work, the design work, the content work, the the writing, all of that plays in because I also heard somewhere that like the definition of brand is like the gap between like the market value of your offer and what someone is willing to pay yeah what makes up that gap is like the emotional investment someone I mean, has just, in your brand just think about cars like cars right. is a perfect example of that like you think of mercedes or bmw or whatever and you just know like okay that's going to be a more expensive car but truthfully it's basically the exact same parts that are in a ford or a renault or like any of these other cars like it's the same thing it's metal it's gears it's like it's like it's all the same stuff but there's a whole brand associated with it that makes it feel a different way. So, you know, and there are some other parts of that that change, but I think like one example I wanted to give here too Mm -hmm. on the increasing the perceived value of your offer for the reducing the effort someone needs to put in. We think WAME is like a perfect example of this where WAME is very much like a done with you type of service. Like we're showing up for you every month on coaching sessions, we're creating things with you, but we don't charge $10,000 for WAME because we're not basically shortening your time to value and then doing a bunch of stuff for you. Now, if we were to say, you're going to join Wayne and we're going to build you a website, an email funnel. We're going to get your product in tip top shape and we're going to have all of your sales emails written in a whole strategy set up for you. 
we would charge $10,000 for that because that would be enough for that, but we don't. So that's why we keep the price for when where we keep it. Yep. But it's just important to see, I think those examples of when you're pricing your product and when you're looking at things really to understand like, if I'm trying to sell something for $1,500, like we've given in this example, is it actually worth someone paying that based on the perceived value of all the things we've been talking about? And if it's not, that's not a knock on you for picking the wrong price. It's just you to go, oh, okay, I need to do one of these things, or I also need to just lower the price to be okay with that. That's okay too. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just a puzzle, right? It's like making sure they match. Yeah. And so this is really helpful because you can kind of evaluate on those six or seven things, come back to your spectrum and go, okay, like let's say I would say, okay, I'm gonna think about how I can deliver my offer in a shorter time frame. I'm gonna increase accountability to make the outcome more probable, and I'm gonna change the outcome I'm selling in order to land your first paid sponsored video for $10,000. Like I'm gonna make that my outcome, not the 100K subscribers. And so maybe then I could even up my price because the value is gonna be more. So, Economical, check. Got it. Last two, social proof and singular. So this really pertains to your sales message. And your sales message is where you execute on the strategy that you set with your chef's kiss offer. So all that work that you did to align these three things won't pay off unless you can connect the dots back to your audience, right? So when it comes to, let's take the example of creating your sales page. So this uh, sales page template is actually from our page layout library, if you haven't checked that out yet. You have access to that? You have access to that. There's two different um, sales page layouts that you can kind of like copy and use and adapt for yourself. Um, and then also in our sales launch from start to finish, we go over our pop sip, pop sip formula for designing a compelling sales page. So definitely check that out if you wanna know how to create a compel, compel help. You got it, you got it. Compelling sales page. Nailed it, first okay. try, really, um, honestly. I should just do this in Portuguese. Okay, great. It would be the same. <laughs> But the two absolutely things that you want to make sure that you include are the social proof and making sure that you communicate that your how your offer is singular. Meaning for your social proof, example here on this sales page, you can see, yes, there are testimonials, but they're right after the outcome, right? So on the sales page, we've said by the end of this program, you'll know exactly how to check, check, check. Here's the outcome. And then ideally you want testimonials from people who have gotten that outcome. And this is where really where it takes some being honest about like, have I gotten people the solution that I've promising that people are going to get right? And if the answer is no, that's okay. How can you Yeah. like, and I mean, how can you like figure out a way to do some type of test pilot program where you can get testimonials and you can really be in the trenches with someone to hone your system so that then you can create this chef's kiss offer. Because the more that you have real results that, that you can share, not inflated testimonials, not, you know, what do we call them? Like pie in the sky promises, but really people being like, yeah, I went from hit here to there with this system that is in this offer and that's really where people are going to go okay i trust that if i join this or if i do this or if i buy this then i am going to get what i'm looking for it's really about trust and so social proof is great for building general trust but even better is connecting it to your promised outcome so that's the proof part that's like that's the evidence that someone wants to see so it's really worth going hey on my sales page like if your sales aren't where you want them to be Look at your sales page and go, am I connecting this social proof to the outcome that I'm promising? And then going into singular, you also want to make sure that you're communicating like how your program is different or how your offer is different. So an example here would just be right in the headline. So create easy gluten-free meals each week without complicated recipes. Maybe all of these programs on the market are all about the complicated recipe. And this is some, some area where I'm trying to carve out a niche to be singular. You can also do that in your branding. You can also do that in your copywriting. Like what is that sort of singular voice, that differentiator that you're gonna infuse into everything that you do in order to make someone go, okay, I ha yes, I've tried this before, or yes, I've thought about how to solve my problem with this, but I haven't tried this particular flavor of that. So having a singular offer is about highlighting what makes you different and what makes your offer different. So your sales page checklist should match your kisses checklist, right? So ask yourself, does your sales page speak directly to your audience's problems? Does it speak to how your solution and its benefits slash features alleviate those problems? Does your passion, interest, and excitement come through in the copy? Do you explain the vehicle delivery and scalability in an enticing way? So the scalable part of the kisses checklist is really for you. It's just about like, is this sustainable for you? But I think it's also cool to figure out a way to infuse on your um, page about like, why did you package it in this way? 
right? So you don't necessarily have to say like, so that I could like put in less effort and get more out. That's not what you need to say, but it's like, is there something about the delivery method that is enticing? Is it that you get to go at it at your own pace? Is it that you're in a group environment so you get to meet other people? Is it that it's a one-on-one -on -one so you really get a lot of my time and expertise? Like, I think explaining that is helpful. Does it have social proof that instills trust that they'll achieve the outcome promise? We just talked about that. Does it adequately speak to the value provided and position the economics of price in a way that makes sense? So infusing certain things of understanding, like why is it this price? Like, and again, really that's about the psychology of like understanding what the value is, what am I getting out of it? And it does that match the price. And then do you explain how your offer is singular and different from similar offers on the market? Got some more deep dives for you. If you want to go into, uh, I know Caroline mentioned the sales launch start to finish session. So check out part two of that if you wanna get more in the weeds on your offer and your sales page and specifically getting your messaging right with whatever it is that you're selling and the workbook will help you there. And then also we mentioned the page layout library. If you don't know where this is, you can go to the Wayme library and you can search page layout that will bring you to the uh, 10 templates that we've created for you. And by the way, if you've never checked out the page layout library and you're looking to do any type of redesign on your website, it's gonna be really helpful because there's copy prompts, there's high fidelity wireframes, there's mockups of designs that you can basically just copy if you want to. That's what those were created for. So make sure to check out the page layout library as well. All right. And then selling your offer is just one step in the journey. So don't forget that your offer success also hinges on delivering the solutions promise and improving over time. And just really quickly, here are four ways that you can improve the fulfilled offer itself. So meaning like the actual thing that you create. So we just wrote a newsletter very um, recently about this, but invest in the deliverable itself. So you could, the goal here would be to make your offer more relevant. So really like, is it new modules? Is it reconfiguring some of the information? Um, invest in the packaging. So the goal here would be to make it easier to consume or more fun or higher quality. You could invest in the results engine. This is probably gonna be the highest payoff. So we just talked about that. Like, can you make it easier to apply the value in your offer and achieve the desired outcome? What are the ways to make that easier? Is it accountability? Is it, um, you know, a, a schedule? Is it a plant? Like, what is it in order to get someone those results that your offer, your solution can get them? And then you can invest in the personalization. So goal, make it more tailored to your customer. That's always gonna be more valuable. Now you might be wondering like, what about one offer versus many offers? Um, this goes back to our identifying your offer session as well. We talk about this in that session. I just didn't have time to cover it here, but we kind of think of this as three different offer models. So the one that we covered in this whole session, which I do think is like the thing to aspire to is because it's simple and because it will create a more calm business for you. And that's the exceptional chef's kiss offer. However, if you have multiple offers, we highly recommend creating a tasting menu, meaning a value ladder. So at least if you have multiple offers, trying to organize them in such a way that you are meeting people at different parts of the journey so that it makes sense and you're leading them in a journey instead of trying to fill up a bunch of buckets um, at one time, which is what kind of the a la carte offers. It doesn't mean you can't do this in your business. It just means you know there are pros and cons to each one and kind of know what you're getting into. So. Highly recommend once again, going back to the identifying your offer session and specifically the section about, uh, there's an entire one of the parts is about the three different types of offer models. So just to recap here, an offer is simply an exchange of value for money. You have your solution, your price, your audience, and in order to have an offer that sells, you need these things in alignment and your message is the glue that pulls it all together. So as a recap, think kisses. So is your offer a solution to have a specific problem? That is your offer a solution to a specific problem your audience knows they have? Is this offer something you can enjoy delivering? Can you stick with it long-term? As you sell more units of your offer, does the profit potential outweigh the energy input? Do you have testimonials, results, and evidence to show that your solution works? Does your customer believe the value of your solution is worth more than the price? And is your offer unique and compelling compared to similar offers out there?